Hello, welcome back to League Alerts Weekly, your weekly news source on the NBA. I'm Aaron Shapo. Unfortunately, Viraj could not join us, but you still got me, and there's a lot of content to go over, so let's get right into it. So the Denver Nuggets are in the process of making a huge comeback against the Los Angeles Clippers after previously being down 3-1. to one. They are now about to enter their Game 7 on Tuesday. This uh, video has been recorded on Monday. And just like with the Utah Jazz, the Nuggets managed to stay alive from a thread and are now right back in it. Nikola Jokic has been a huge part of this. Their superstar has averaged 25.8 points per game, 12 rebounds per game, and 5.5 assists. Uh, he has been absolutely crucial for them and has tore the Los Angeles Clippers defense apart. As you know, they have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George on the perimeter, and they also have Patrick Beverly. Their perimeter defense is absolutely fantastic, but their interior defense is not as good. Not to knock Ivica Zubats or Montrezl Harrell, but Zubats is not the greatest defender, and Montrezl Harrell is only six foot seven. So it's very easy for Nikola Jokic to either shoot a mid range over them or get inside. It has been a very key, it has been a deciding factor for these past two games where Nikola Jokic has averaged 28 points, 14 rebounds, and six assists. He has been the catalyst for their offense, and his defense has not been that bad either. They've been stopping the Clippers from scoring, as the Clippers are also a defensive oriented team. So it's not as easy for them to just go out and score if they're struggling. Uh, well, along with Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray had averaged 19.7 points per game, 6.7 assists, and shot 46.5% from deep during the series. Obviously, he has not been doing the same thing that he did against the Jazz, but he's still been a crucial factor for the Denver Nuggets and a great second option to Jokic, especially during these last two games where he averaged 23.5 points per game. He did average a few less assists at six, but shot 66.7% from deep, shooting six for nine from beyond the arc. The two of them are creating a huge dynamic duo that could be one of the best ones in the league soon. We're seeing LeBron James and Anthony Davis, Kawhi Leonard and uh, Paul George, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Let's not count out Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray. The two of them have been absolutely fantastic for this team, and they have led them back to a Game 7 again and are possibly about to ooh, take their second Game 7 after being down 3-1. to one. That does not mean we should cut the Los Angeles Clippers out, though, because Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are not going to just let a Game 7 go under the go get away from them. Paul George has not been playing as bad as he did against the Mavericks for the first few games. He's actually been pretty solid. He's been quite consistent. So it is very possible that the Clippers could just stop the Denver Nuggets in their tracks. But one thing's for sure is that this is about to be one of the best games of the playoffs, if, especially if it's any indicator of that Game 7 between the Raptors and Celtics. Now, the other series that, ha that had recently ended was the Lakers-Rockets. The Lakers defeated the Rockets in five despite losing game one. LeBron James and Anthony Davis finally began to show how dangerous they are as a duo. LeBron James averaged 25.8 points, 10.4 rebounds, and 7.4 assists during that series and really showed what playoff LeBron is all about. There seems to be a trend with the Lakers losing their first game, but then winning their next four. So if they lose their first game in the conference finals, don't let that alarm you. Wait until game two to see if they're going to lose that one, because it seems to be a habit for them to kind of wake up after a game and get used to the other team's system. And meanwhile, LeBron's other half, Anthony Davis, also averaged a solid 25.4 points, 12.4 rebounds, and 4.0 assists. The two of them have been absolutely deadly, and there was nothing the Rockets could do, as they proved that size does still matter in the NBA. And... If you don't have anyone above the height of 6'9", it's going to be very hard to guard people like Anthony Davis, Dwight Howard, JaVale McGee. But Anthony Davis in particular was really killing the Rockets with his fadeaway jumper, kind of like Dirk Nowitzki. And it was the Rockets couldn't do anything about it because he's just too tall. Along with those two, though, Rajon Rondo made his return during this series, and he actually looked really good. And Kevin Durant said that uh, they have their next big three they have their own big three now with Rajon Rondo joining the Lakers after his injury. He's been a great defender and very good playmaker for them and has been definitely a key part as to why they won some of those closer games against the Rockets. And had it not been for Rondo, this game could have easily went to six or even seven games. But unfortunately for the Rockets, that wasn't the case. And they ended up losing in five. And their chemistry has appeared to take a very big hit. Uh, there was reports of shouting in their locker room after their game four loss. And after game five, their head coach, Mike D'Antoni, who set up this entire small ball roster, has now quit, or they, he agreed to part ways because his contract was up, and no one knows where he's going to go. But that's what we're going to be dis discussing in his next segment. We're going to be discussing Mike D'Antoni and several other NBA coaches that are possibly going to be going elsewhere and where vacant coaching spots are. Starting with Mike D'Antoni, who had 
recently announced that he's going to step down as the Rockets head coach as his contract is up and where he might go. There are three top teams that I have in mind, mainly the Philadelphia 76ers, Indiana Pacers, and the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, personally, I think the most likely of the three are the Philadelphia 76ers because the 76ers have some great defensive players in Josh Richardson, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Al Horford, but they really struggle on offense. So I think that they're going to want an offensive coach to level them out because they don't really need someone to help them on defense that much anymore since their players already know what they're doing on defense. They have an incredible defensive lineup. So I think with Mike D'Antoni, they could really improve. Players like Shake Milton could become much better They could because Milton's really their only pure offensive-minded player on the team. So start him at point guard and, you know, have Mike D'Antoni help him out a bit. And they could really do something with him. He could really break out. And, of course, possibly help Ben Simmons with the shooting. And if not, then he could find ways to get Ben Simmons open inside or help him with his playmaking. Because Mike D'Antoni is arguably the greatest offensive coach of all time. We saw what he did with the Suns, uh, Steve Nash. We saw what he did in Houston with Harden. He really does know what he's doing. And although he hasn't quite gotten that ring, he definitely would have a chance in Philly with Simmons and Embiid being his new duo. So if Mike D'Antoni was to go there, I think it could work out really well. But if he doesn't, then the Indiana Pacers are also a solid option. The Pacers had fired their uh, coach, Nate McMillan, because of, because of their constant lack of success in the playoffs. Uh, it wasn't totally McMillan's fault, though, because no, DeMontis Sabonis uh, was injured and did not play in the playoffs. But despite that, they felt it was time to move on, so they fired him. And Mike D'Antoni could work there as well. But I don't think he's as much of a good fit. The Pacers are already pretty good on offense and defense. I think they just need a more unifying figure. And if they can get that, then the Pacers should be good. And the third team that I was thinking of was the San Antonio Spurs. And I know what you're thinking, but Aaron, uh, isn't Greg Popovich there? Well, he sold his house. If you check legalistofficial.com, you can see the article I wrote on that. He sold his house, and even though he's and he is considering either retiring or going somewhere else, possibly he may not return to San Antonio. So if that's the case, then the Spurs should try to get Mike D'Antoni because he really knows what he's doing, and he could help players like Dejounte Murray, uh, Keldon Johnson, and several of their other young players. He could really be useful to help develop their offensive skills. The knock on Mike D'Antoni, of course, is his lack of you know defensive talent as a coach. Uh, that was the big kick for both Houston and Phoenix when he would lead them to constantly good records. But in the playoffs, they, their defense couldn't hold their own and they could never actually advance that far in the playoffs. They could get to the second round, but they really couldn't get further than that as shown by the Lakers against the Rockets. And because of that, it's a lot harder for Mike D'Antoni to find a team that can really get him that championship ring that he clearly wants a lot. So I think that the Philadelphia 76ers are the best choice for him. Now, another coach that... Now, as for the Rockets side, a coach that they could go for is someone like Tyrone Liu. Tyrone Liu is a former championship coach with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, many may argue that, you know, he was just riding LeBron, and he probably was, but he still knows what he's doing. He's been a, a Clippers assistant coach for a year, and for all we know, he could be quite good. He got fired from the Cavaliers about a year and a half ago, and John Beeline took over. I guess it was two years now, but yeah, he was fired from the Cavaliers recently, and John Beeline took over, and then Beeline was fired, but... Uh, Tyron Liu knows what he's doing, and there's definitely a chance that he could get a job with the Houston Rockets. Another option for the Rockets is Jason Kidd, the former player coach who is one of the greatest basketball minds of all time. He had a coaching job with the Milwaukee Bucks when Giannis Antetokounmpo was developing, but was fired after the lack of playoff success, which hasn't actually been solved yet. So it may not be a knock on Jason Kidd as much as we think, since now it's been two coaches. So if that is the case, then I don't see any reason why the Rockets shouldn't give him a chance. He's currently a, uh, an assistant coach for the Lakers and really does know what he's doing. It's very – I think Jason Kidd will get another chance, and I think that he could actually prove himself this time because he's matured a bit. He knows what he's doing now, and it's very possible that he could be the pick. And the third pick for the Rockets head coach is going to be Chauncey Billups. Chauncey Billups is one of the greatest basketball minds of all time. He was absolutely fantastic on both the Pistons and Nuggets. And he's just amazing. He deserves to be a coach, and he's definitely going to get it despite his lack of experience, uh, kind of like Steve Nash did, because they're both great basketball minds, and that is the sole reason why they're getting the job, because of their great basketball minds. So Chauncey Billups on the Rockets would be a bit interesting, especially with their whole small ball lineup. It's going to be very difficult for the Rockets to – get a coach that can really fit into that, especially with their cap space and their cap situation. So unless they can trade Westbrook and then get a big man back, I think it's going to be very hard for any coach. But Chauncey Billups 
could pull it off. So could Jason Kidd. And even so could Tyrone Lue. Like, they know what they're doing. These are great basketball minds. They know, they know how to w- get a championship team. Tyrone Lue's already done it. And uh, both Jason Kidd and Chauncey Billups have won their championships in their career. However, it does not look like Chauncey Billups would sign with the Rockets as much because the Pacers have a clear interest in him. Uh, there have been reports coming out that Chauncey Billups is one of their top candidates for the head coaching job. So if Chauncey Billups was to go to his rival, the Pacers, that would be somewhat ironic, but it would also be a very interesting move. Uh, Billups would be, gr- would be great for a player like Victor Oladipo, who is still coming off of injury, and, Bill- uh, and Billups knows how to implement that play style as a player who is an incredible defender and can still shoot the ball pretty well and lead their team to victories without having, to ne- without having the ball in their hands. So it's going to be very interesting to see how these coaches play out. We will see very soon as the NBA offseason approaches, and I can't wait. But for our next, but for our next segment, we're going to be discussing the Heat versus the the Heat versus the Celtics predictions. So stay tuned. Miami and Boston. So this is going to be an incredibly good matchup. It's actually the first matchup in Eastern Conference history where there was not a one or two seed in it, and. It's a very even matchup, and it's really hard to say who will win. I'm going to go over the matchups first and then give my final prediction. So the point guard uh, matchup is going to be Goran Dragic versus Kemba Walker. And I do think that although Goran Dragic is criminally underrated, he is absolutely amazing, especially in these playoffs. He's been a great veteran leader for them and an incredible shooter. I do have to give it to Kemba Walker. He is just slightly better at... Just about everything. He's a slightly better all-around player. He's a great playmaker, a great shooter, and really good at driving. I think that Kemba Walker is just a tiny bit better, and so I do have to give that one to him. Uh, but that does not mean that it's going to be a blah. I think that it's barely going to be Kemba Walker. I think that Drogic is going to hold his own, but I do have to give that matchup to Kemba Walker. Now, the second matchup is the Boston Celtics' biggest advantage, Duncan Robinson versus Jalen Brown. Now, although Duncan Robinson is an absolutely fantastic shooter, there's just no stopping Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown is one of the best perimeter defenders in the league, and he can do everything Duncan can do on offense, just not quite as good a shooter. And I just don't see Duncan Robinson uh, fighting Jalen Brown like that. I do have to give this one to Jalen Brown pretty easily, and it's going to be the clear-cut uh, Boston advantage right there. And so expect them, especially at the beginning of the game, to be running it through Jalen Brown a lot. Now, as for small forwards, you got – uh, Jimmy Butler versus Gordon Hayward. And if you had told me this matchup three years ago, I probably would have given it to Hayward, but Jimmy Butler is just too good now. And Hayward's still coming off of injuries. He's not quite the same player he was in uh, Utah. So I have to give it to Jimmy Butler. He's just an incredible defender and his three point shot seems to have returned after he arrived, after he arrived at the bubble. So I do think Jimmy Butler is going to be coming out of this victorious And I don't think that's going to be close either. I think Jimmy Butler is going to destroy Gordon Hayward. But then we get to the power forward matchup, Jay Crowder and Jason Tatum. And obviously I have to give this one to Tatum, even though Crowder is a great defender. Tatum is a future, Tatum's a future MVP candidate. There's no stopping Tatum. He's been absolutely fantastic for the Celtics. And I just don't see how uh, Crowder can hold his own against Tatum. I think Tatum will win. I think that Crowder will do solid against him. And I do not think it will be the same blowout matchup as Jalen Brown and Duncan Robinson, but I do think that Jason Tatum will uh, take out Jay Crowder in a good portion. And then the center matchup is the uh, Miami Heat's biggest advantage, and that's Bam Adebayo versus Daniel Tice. I understand Daniel Tice is good, and I understand that Bam Adebayo is also undersized for a center, but he's just so fantastic on interior defense and his mid-range shot gives him a huge edge. There's nothing anyone can do about Bam Adebayo when he's inside, and he's a great defender both on the perimeter and inside uh, uh, against the Celtics. So I don't think Daniel Tice is going to be doing much against Bam Adebayo. However, vice versa, I think Bam Adebayo will be scoring on Daniel Tice a good amount. I understand Daniel Tice is also a pretty solid interior defender, but the athleticism difference between Tice and Adebayo is very obvious. And I just don't see how Tice can hold his own against Adebayo. I think Adebayo is going to ultimately wreck uh, Daniel Tice in this matchup. And then we move on to the bench. When you look at the starting lineup, I guess you still think that the Celtics will probably win because uh, Walker, Brown, and Tatum all have the advantage in their perspective matchups. But when you get to the bench, it's very obvious that Miami's bench is loads better than Boston's bench. And that means that if Miami has a player that's struggling, they can take him out. While 
if Boston does, they can't really. And we've seen Kemba Walker struggle in a few games. We've seen Tatum struggle in a few games. And there's not really anyone to replace them, unlike with the Heat, which is where their biggest advantage is. The Miami bench consists of Kendrick Nunn, an incredible rookie and third place in Rookie of the Year voting. Teller Harrow, also an incredible rookie who's made the all-rookie second team. Andre Iguodala, one of the best veteran defensive presences in the league. And Kelly Olynyk, who's one of the best big shooters. And the four of them honestly could form a starting lineup. Like, I could see any of these four in a starting lineup on another team. It is that the Miami team is so stacked that these players end up being on the bench to make one of the best bench teams that the NBA has ever seen. And you contrast that with the Boston Celtics, who, yes, Brad Wanamaker is an all right player. And then you also got Grant Williams and Robert Williams, also all right players, but they're massively undersized for their positions. And I just don't see how they can do anything against players like Kelly Olynyk and Andre Iguodala. So I think that because of the bench, this gives Miami the advantage overall in the series. And I do think that Miami will take the series in six games. The uh, Heat are just too good. They, they're too deep and they can rest their players while the Boston Celtics cannot afford to as much because they don't have the same matchup stats for their, back, for their backups. And because of that, the Heat are the clear team. Oh, I wouldn't say clear team, but the Heat, I think, are going to be the team to win it. And I think that they're going to be moving on to the finals to play the winner of the Western Conference Finals, whether that would be the Lakers, the Clippers, or the Nuggets. But that will about do it for today's episode. Uh, be sure to come next week. Uh, I Don't worry, Viraj will be back. It won't just be me talking to myself, so we'll have some discussions going on. But until then, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe, and I'll catch you later.